Uh, my name is Chris Reagan, and I am the director of the Max Bell School of Public Policy at McGill. Uh, and let me begin by saying that I am coming to you today from my home in Gimli, Manitoba, which is situated on what is referred to as Treaty One territory, the traditional lands of the Ashina Anishinaabe. Excuse me. Many of you are closer to McGill's downtown Montreal campus, in which case you are on the traditional territory of the Kanikahaka, which is often called the Mohawk Nation. But wherever you are currently sitting, and I know that many of you are from outside of Canada today, I encourage you to better understand the history of your location, to recognize its Indigenous heritage. Now, let me just briefly uh, give you a, the rules of engagement for today. This will be repetitive for all of those who are at the first two sessions, but it's still worthwhile uh, hearing the rules. The team has 30 minutes for their presentation. At the 28 minute mark, my egg timer will go off uh, and uh, that will be quite audible. Then we'll have 10 minutes for questions from the faculty and I'm gonna ask the faculty members uh, to limit themselves to two questions if they can. And any, if there's a third question, I'll put it into the general Q&A. Then we go to 10 minutes for questions from the sponsors, then 10 minutes for the general Q&A. So please put your questions in the chat box and, uh, and then I will moderate uh, the Q&A from then. So without further ado, this session, uh, the sponsor for the Policy Lab is the uh, Competition Bureau. Um, and the challenge is what drives switching costs in Canada's insurance markets and what policy changes could reduce those costs and promote competition. So Team Competition Bureau, please take it away. Great, are my slides okay? Yes, they are. Perfect. Hi everyone, uh, nice of you to all be here today. We're so excited uh, to be with you. Over the last eight months, we have been undertaking a study with the Competition Bureau, as Chris mentioned, on switching costs in the property and casualty insurance industry in Canada. Switching is a key feature of a thriving competitive market, so it is a useful measure to understand the current consumer experience and whether there is sufficient competition. My name is Emily Nickerson, and I've been working on this research with my colleagues Adele Brawley, Dorothy Kwok, and John Lesarge, who will be presenting alongside me today. To give you a sense of what we're going to discuss, I just briefly wanted to go over the structure. First, we'll provide some more detail on what the problem is. Then we'll unpack the issue and explore what is happening in Canada, particularly in Ontario's auto insurance market. Then we'll look to lessons in other jurisdictions in Canada and around the world to see how they have addressed these issues as well as beyond the current state to future concerns. We'll then wrap it up with recommendations for how the switching challenges identified could be addressed with considerations for both the Competition Bureau as well as provincial and territorial regulators. So what's the problem? Property and casualty insurance in Canada includes a diverse set of products that are regulated provincially and federally. These are delivered by public and private provision, and some products are mandatory while others are optional. In 2019, the industry had about 180 billion in total assets and employed over 130,000 people. Car insurance made up the majority of the business at about 42%. There are approximately 109 private companies offering auto insurance in Canada, and government-owned providers in BC, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Quebec. Auto insurance is particularly unique since it's a required product for all drivers and thus impacts the pocketbooks of the majority of adult Canadians. However, from coast to coast, drivers complain of high car insurance rates. Regulators have sought to address these concerns in recent years, but have achieved little success in the biggest markets. Slightly outdated estimates by the Insurance Bureau of Canada from 2019 indicate that the average annual auto insurance premium in Ontario is around 1,500 and 1,300 in Alberta. These rates are the second and third highest in the country, only behind BC, and the highest rates where coverage is provided solely by the private sector. However, the rates in the Greater Toronto Area far exceed these averages. In Toronto, for example, prices hover between 2,000 and 2,600 a year. 
While insurance companies maintain that rates rise proportional to the claims that they receive, competitive markets need an informed consumer who can switch between products if they find a better price or product. In Canada, the percentage of consumers that switch their provider in the last 12 months hovers around 11% for auto insurance and falls to 8% in Ontario. Reducing the cost of switching for consumers is a key way to ensure costs do not exceed what consumers are willing to pay, and overall, this will increase competition in the sector. I'll pass it to Dorothy, who will provide a bit more context on the regulatory framework related to PNC insurance in Canada. Thanks, Emily. First, I want to restate that a main feature that protects consumer interests is the ability to switch between providers in the competitive market. We all know the divisions of power between federal and provincial governments. But the objective of both levels legislation is to promote competition in PNC insurance and protect consumer interests through switching. When we look into the rules in national level, the Competition Act encourages competition between all businesses in all sectors. The Act not only ensures equal opportunity for small and medium companies, but also ensures competitive prices and product choice for consumers. Businesses across the country must follow federal legislation when they offer products. For example, the proposed Bill C-11, companies must comply with the bill in issue related to data portability and data privacy. What about in provincial and territorial level? Regulators have jurisdiction over insurance products and market practices, including consumer interest protection and regulation to range from price rating to claim processes to marketing. In our case study, the Financial Services Regulatory Authority of Ontario, FISRA, is the regulator of PNC insurance. Its mandate are public education, transparency and information disclosure, increasing public confidence, and deterring fraudulent or deceptive practices. More specifically on consumer protection, FISRA focuses on improving consumer safety, fairness, and choice, which implicitly include monitoring and promoting switching. Further, FISRA encourages competition and innovation in the financial service sector, both of which necessitate efforts to promote switching. For the mandate of our project, as we introduced, we will limit the scope to PNC insurance in Canada. Our team tried to answer the four key elements that the Bureau would like to know. First, what is the current state of competition in the marketplace? Second, do switching costs or other barriers to consumer mobility exist and what are they? Third, what, company, what policy changes can reduce switching costs and improve the level of competition in PNC space? And lastly, what information gaps exist in the market that would assist policymakers if they are addressed. Next, my colleague Adele is going to unpack the issue of our project. Thank you, Dorothy. Before I go into unpacking the issue, I'm just gonna begin with a quick note on our methods. To come up with our recommendations, we conducted desktop research, 13 stakeholder and expert interviews, and analyzed survey data on switching collected by Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada in 2020. Now to briefly unpack our definition of switching costs and why switching matters. While there is no single agreed upon definition of switching costs, for our purposes, we define it as barriers, whether that be monetary or non-monetary, that consumers run up against when switching or attempting to switch service providers. Examples of this include fees for terminating contracts, requirements to be in person at a service point to terminate or transfer a service, the inability to access the information required to make an informed comparison and decision about switching, or the inability to ensure that your personal data carries over to new providers. This matters because reducing switching costs is key to achieving efficient outcomes and competition in a marketplace. Reduced switch switching costs allow consumers to access policies that maximize their utility, creating greater efficiency in the marketplace. And reducing these costs also facilitates entry into the market by new firms since new firms are able to capture consumers and achieve the necessary scale required to be real competitors and contain the market power of larger firms. This diagram breaks down the consumer journey in the Canadian PNC insurance industry, which we've identified as four separate steps. Step one is the initial search in which consumers first encounter the insurance industry and might not be aware of their specific insurance needs or how to meet them. 
They also might be searching for providers online themselves or through an insurance broker who acts as an information intermediary between firms and consumers. Step two is the sign up, at which point an understanding of the actual contract is sometimes lacking among consumers because of the language used and overly complicated terms in the contract itself. Step three is what we're calling the policy control step or the point at which consumers are active customers of a specific provider and want to control their policies more directly through digital technologies. This desire for more digital control is a change that we've identified across Canada and in other jurisdictions, and is something that the insurance industry at large has been slow to meet. And finally, step four is the renewal. And this is where shopping around would be done, but consumers aren't necessarily equipped with an adequate understanding of their own policies or the policies available to them elsewhere. Lastly, on the right hand side of this diagram is a short list of the barriers to consumer mobility that we have found and we'll be coming back to these later on in the presentation. So these are price bundling locked in effects a lack of maturity in digital offerings a lack of economic trust between consumers and firms and the culture around switching. And now I'll turn it over to John to discuss the Canadian context more specifically. Thank you, Adele. And to kick off our taste study, I'll start with the key question. Why are we investigating Ontario's auto insurance market? Well, for starters, Ontario's auto insurance market by virtue of the province's population is the largest in Canada. It has the highest auto insurance prices and relatively low rates of switching indicating there may be a problem in terms of market barriers and barriers to consumers. To summarize the structure of the market once more, auto insurance in Ontario is a mandatory, privately distributed and publicly regulated product, and FISRA is the market regulator. Next, I want to highlight what types of coverage can be purchased. On the left of the diagram is basic coverage, and on the right is optional coverage. Basic coverage includes third-party liability for lawsuits, statutory accident benefits, which provides no-fault accident benefits, direct compensation, which covers damages, uninsured automobile coverage, which covers costs incurred by uninsured drivers. And I'm not going to extrapolate the optional coverage, but I'm happy to expand on it later if desired. Let's think about prices now. Ontario's auto insurance market has some of the highest prices in the country, depending on where you live. It's also important to consider how easy or not it is for consumers to compare their prices and their options. FISRA's predecessor, the Financial Services Commission of Ontario, had a comparison tool on their website that was based on postal codes and companies. Their previous tool has not been migrated over to FISRA's new website. However, FISRA has a general comparison tool which compares prices, average prices, based on different regions and or typical plans. The comparisons of average costs of policies provided on their website are displayed on this slide. There is the average cost of a basic plan based on certain factors on the left. The average cost consumer pay, consumers pay in Ontario is in the middle. And the average cost, the price, the average cost of a high cost optional plan is on the right. So let's consider now how easy or not it is for consumers to actually switch their plans. It's easy enough in principle for consumers to switch. However, based on the tools at their disposal and the way that products are being bundled together, for example, home and auto bundles, and the unclear messaging consumers may receive in advertisements, consumers are actually incentivized to remain loyal to their current providers. Let's see if the data supports this assertion. In 2020, Innovation, Science and Economic Development Canada, also known as ISED, commissioned a survey through Canada's Privy Council Office to assess the switching barriers of a random sample of Canadians from across the country. The study ran from March to August of 2020, and we have used some of that data in our research. The motivations of Ontarians for switching, as displayed in the graph, are generally in line with national trends, but with a few key exceptions. What this graph doesn't tell us, though, is that based on our data, Ontario's consumers are much more likely to renegotiate their contracts when they expire annually at the end of the year, rather than switch. Ontario's switching rates are actually on the lower end of the Canadian spectrum. 8% of Ontarian respondents surveyed switched in the last 12 months, whereas 26% of respondents from Ontario indicated that they had renegotiated their insurance policies in the last year. 
Recent reports released by the Ontario government highlight some of the main barriers that consumers face. The Marshall Report, which was released in 2017, involved extensive industry consultations. It highlights a lack of flexibility in the basic coverage options. And it also explains that duplicative medical coverage provides potentially one avenue through which to explore reform to basic coverage. FISRA's Residence Reference Panel on Auto Insurance, a report published in March of 2021, involved thorough and representative consumer interviews and consultations. And this report called for timelier claims service, increased optionality and innovation, more plain language in policies, and greater product transparency relating to the costs informing premiums. It should be noted that the existing regulatory framework does not require insurers in Ontario to disclose the details of what exactly they earn from drivers, including what they actually pay out on claims compared to what they bring in from premiums. Now, FISRA has recently introduced measures to address some of the noted switching challenges. They brought in an enhanced consumer information hub. They now publish auto insurance rate approvals, allowing for greater transparency. They also established the Consumer Advisory Panel and Consumer Office. The panel offers a consumer perspective on proposed FISRA policy changes and advises the Consumer Office in serving as consumer's voice within the organization. Now that said, there is still much work to be done. Switching would be enhanced through greater product differentiation in basic policies. On this note, increased flexibility for companies and consumers might come through, for example, removing duplicative coverage where it is seen to exist. We also need to harness innovation for increased transparency in prices. So on that note, you can think about usage-based insurance as being a potential avenue for solutions. Improve data collection to better evaluate switching rates and motivations. Create more effective comparison tools. Enable simpler contracts with plain language. And finally, introduce proactive measures monitoring false advertisements. And with that, I'll pass it back to Emily. Thanks so much, John. So acknowledging the gaps that John's highlighted in the case of Ontario, I want to take us to other jurisdictions in Canada and to other countries around the world to see how they are monitoring switching costs and attempting to reduce them for consumers. Let's first start with Ireland. The Irish competition regulator, the Competition and Consumer Protection Commission, undertook a survey in 2016 of consumer behavior with the aim to understand switching rates across various sectors. Auto insurance was one of these sectors, and it had one of the highest rates of switching. 71% of the population has car insurance in Ireland, and of those, 28% switched, and 19% switched and saved. Despite switching rates that more than double the Canadian average, the regulator introduced new measures in 2019 to promote shopping around and switching. The Central Bank of Ireland began requiring auto insurance providers to disclose at renewal what consumers had paid the previous year. In addition, all auto, household, and non-life insurance policy providers had to extend renewal notice periods by five business days to 20 days in total, with the aim to encourage shopping around. Now moving around the world to Australia, in 2011, the Australian Securities and Investments Commission launched an online financial literacy and comparison tool called MoneySmart. On MoneySmart, Australian consumers can use a variety of price comparison tools and rate calculators. One of these is a general insurance rate calculator. It shows consumers what types of rates they are approved for directly through the regulator's rating system. Both the power given to this commission to approve general insurance rates and their direct online interactions with consumers has largely reduced consumer comparison of products to price alone. In addition, the comparison to a website has become effectively a third party seller, which has crowded out other private sector actors, especially brokers. Bringing it back to Canada, auto insurance in Alberta is delivered by the private sector and is a mandatory product that is heavily regulated, similar to Ontario. As I mentioned at the start of the presentation, Alberta has the third highest auto insurance rates in Canada. The regulatory body is the Automobile Insurance Rate Board, and they actively monitor consumer switching in auto insurance through the consumer representative. This representative is independent and solicits consumer feedback on acquiring insurance. 
Since the early 2000s, the representative has been annually measuring the percentage of consumers switching to new policies or providers and the reason for switching. More recently, data on the ability to get a comparative quote has also been collected. The aim of these annual reviews is to make sure that consumers are adequately represented in the annual review process, which determines industry benchmarks. These lessons show examples of tested methods to increase shopping around and switching, including extended renewal periods, disclosure of the amount paid the previous year, and an online comparison tool. The case of Australia particularly provides a cautionary tale of comparison tool design. Finally, to support these interventions, Alberta illustrates the, the tools that regulators can use to provide strong oversight of consumer experience and switching costs. I'll turn it over to Dorothy, who will take us beyond the current state to future considerations for these challenges. Thank you. We have identified three emerging challenges that impact switching in the industry. The first one is the COVID-19 pandemic. It has severely affected the auto insurance industry. The lockdowns and change in working mode have greatly reduced the use of cars. Insurance offered discounts or payment deferral in the early days of the pandemic. But later, the rates increased for a news policy for most drivers in markets where rates are not heavily regulated. It is because insurance are more conservative than before when they evaluate the future risk given the uncertainty in economic recovery. The biggest unknown in the post-COVID world will be whether driver will return to public transit or increased driving, which will bring higher claims and premiums. After all, insurance offer different things to clients in the pandemic. Imagine you are the consumers. I'm sure you will stay with or switch to insurance based on whether they have offered support to you in the pandemic as well. This is the framing events from behavioral science perspective. The second challenge is digital transformation. Nowadays, insurance consumer demand for one-stop tailored service. Insurance can now acquire their data by digital technology, for example, charges by the mile driven. They can understand the consumer better and offer more customized products. So companies which can provide improved service to meet this demand can attract consumers to stay with or switch to them. And this combination of artificial intelligence and behavioral economics will be very important in insurance future business strategies. These models transform the insurance industry from risk assessment to risk prevention by adapting psychological incentives to promote healthy style or safe driving. You, as the consumers, will be rewarded by financial benefit after insurance checked your driving data. More fundamentally, if consumers are given the data access or if data mobility is eased, that could further facilitate switching as consumer can easily transfer the information to new providers and increase market competition. But this remains a struggle because the proposed Bill C-11 is not likely to move forward given the coming anticipated election. Besides, the data piece will break down the industry boundary because car manufacturers also claim to own the data from the dashboard and therefore they will start to sell insurance. The last switching challenge is the rollout of autonomous vehicles. New risk will be identified. It may shift the responsibility for vehicle collision from human errors to technology malfunctions. Clarification are needed to determine who is responsible when an accident occurs. Consumer may have to undergo more complex and longer product liability litigation to resolve insurance claim, which may cost a lot in effects. The trend of autonomous vehicle will have a great impact on insurance rates. In the short run, the expensive technology to repair autonomous vehicles will increase insurance premiums. However, in the long run, they are expected to decrease due to relative increase in vehicle safety. What will happen next? The premiums will fall due to the number of insurance claims goes down. Then the size of the auto insurance marketplace will shrink significantly. We could foresee the emergence of self-driving cars may enable some companies to have more data about consumer and increase their market competition. On the same topic of data, the constant monitoring of data is expected 
to be more reliable than human reported information for risk assessment and insurance pricing. However, self-driving cars present questions related to privacy and cybersecurity arising from the collection and sharing of data. During the transition to autonomous cars, insurance policy will have to adapt to a situation where traditional and autonomous vehicles will coexist. Consumer will offer companies that can provide seamless service without the need to send a claim to multiple stakeholders. Therefore, those can adapt to these changes will be more likely to attract consumers to switch to them. And these are the challenges. Now I will turn it over to John, who will kick off our recommendations. Thanks, Dorothy. Before Adele walks through our recommended policy options, I first want to outline the major information gaps that need to be addressed. The following slide breaks down information gaps according to three categories, information gaps for consumers, industry, and government. They are, for consumers, rate transparency. So rate transparency is lacking and consumers have limited information about insurers' risk assessment and premiums. Based on our research, consumers are usually not actively involved in the claims process. Canadians continue to have limited access to their PNC insurance data, which constrains their ease to switch. And for industry, under the current framework, insurers may not fully understand consumers' preferences. Historically, risk auto insurance assessments have relied too heavily on the policyholders' self-reported risk, making it difficult to capture the driver's actual risk. And for government, provincial and territorial regulatory bodies could benefit from a formalized process to collect and disclose consumer insights. Comparable jurisdictions, such as the European Union, have eliminated the use of demographic information in the, prices, the pricing of property and casualty insurance, especially auto, which is an important consideration when we think about the disparate impacts that the current rules have on people from across the province. Now, I'll turn it over to Adele, who will go over our policy recommendations to address the issues we have all outlined. From the switching challenges Emily and Adele mentioned to the issues I highlighted in the Ontario case study, to the emerging issues Dorothy has pointed to. Off to you, Adele. Thank you, John. So pulling all of this together, our recommendations can be grouped into three categories. Number one, increasing product differentiation, allowing consumers to have meaningful choice when considering switching insurance providers. Number two, enhancing consumer understanding to facilitate easier comparison across insurance products. And number three, improving regulatory oversight over the ease of switching for consumers. These are broken down further on the next slide in terms of what the Competition Bureau can do and what provincial regulators can do. We believe that the Competition Bureau is uniquely placed to ensure that best practices are shared between provincial and territorial insurance regulators, which is why we've broken it down here to hopefully highlight those connections. So before we dive in, I should also note that we've listed these in terms of the order in which the Competition Bureau could potentially implement these recommendations. And that order was created based on our discussions with them and what they consider to be feasible and in line with their advocacy mandate. So we've grouped three of our recommendations into a first phase of implementation. This is an information gathering phase, the goal of which um, is to further an understanding on switching and assess the size of the issue in Canada's PNC space. To begin, we think that the Competition Bureau should examine which jurisdictions are collecting data on switching annually, like in Alberta and recommend similar processes in jurisdictions where such data is not being collected or being publicly disclosed. Next, in understanding the size of the issue, the Competition Bureau should prioritize monitoring and addressing consumer perspective perspectives directly through consumer consultations that are consistent with equality and equity principles. Lastly, as part of this phase, the Competition Bureau should build comprehensive advertising recommendations after assessing the types of language used in current advertising practices in the industry. Phase two of implementation is organized around the investment in pilot initiatives and new research. So these recommendations are about prompting consumers in creative ways to shop around from identified best practices. And this begins with an investigation into three issues. Number one, data portability in the industry and consumer access to personalized data. Two, tools that have been used in international jurisdictions to encourage or nudge consumers into shopping around, um, as in the case of Ireland. And three, the use of comparison tools measuring price and the quality of products, as we saw in Australia. 
The Competition Bureau can then provide recommendations and advice to provincial and territorial regulators on implementing pilot programs to encourage switching. Next comes renewed recommendations for provincial regulators in terms of the language used in PNC contracts, a cooperative effort with provincial regulators to examine barriers limiting consumers' uptake of usage-based policies, and lastly, a regulatory review around the use of duplicative coverage, which may be creating adverse effects for lower-income households. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you for listening, and we look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, team. Uh, for the third time running, you have uh, got in under the wire, so you don't have to hear my egg timer. So let me just turn that off. There we go. Okay. Great job. Um, let me uh, first of all turn to our three faculty questioners, uh, Natalie first, and then Jennifer, and then Dirk. Natalie? Thank you, Chris. Thank you, team. Um, so many uh, interesting insights that you shared. There's there's two that I um, have some questions on. The first is around the demographic information. So you highlighted in your brief uh, some of the differences across different demographics of switching behavior. Um, and you also noted um, the discriminatory practices of using demographic data for the risk-based analysis that the insurance companies do. So my first question is, if we were to implement Europe's uh, principles of not using demographic information for risk-based analysis, how would that be um, received by the insurance companies in Canada? So that's question one. Question two really speaks more to the sum of your recommendations. You have nine different recommendations. What I would like to know is how can we quantify the financial and economic impact of implementing those recommendations? Thank you. Great, thanks Natalie. I'm gonna act as a little bit of a, a traffic cop for the questions uh, through this Q&A process. So for your first question on the discriminatory practices and EU regulations and applicability in Canada, I'll, I'll turn that over to Adele. Thanks Emily. Um, yeah, I think it's a really um, interesting question and it's something that we also were wondering as well. Um, I don't think we have an exact answer in terms of like how uh, that type of switch or change would be received by um, the industry itself. Um, I do know that, I mean, it would require a, a wide scale pivot in terms of the types of uh, information that insurers are allowed to use when they're coming up with their pricing schemes. Um, and this relates to uh, another aspect of our brief in terms of usage-based policies, because that could be a potential um, new source of data for insurers to use personalized data that they can collect on uh, a driver's current driving habits and use that um, to come up with their pricing schemes as opposed to demographic identifiers such as uh, age, gender, um, sexual orientation, and, and so on. Um, the issue with that, of course, is that with uh, more personalized data comes other equity considerations, which I think we've also highlighted in our brief. And so um, I don't know if we have an exact uh, answer in terms of how it would be received, but it would require, I think, um, at the minimum, more personalized data collection. And that would also have to come with its own um, equity considerations. Uh, so I'm not sure if any of my colleagues also want to add on to that answer. I think that was great, Adele. Um, maybe because there's a part two to, to Natalie's questions, um, I'll turn that over to Dorothy, if you want to kick us off. So that second piece was around the financial and economic impacts um, of, of our recommendations. Okay, so to quantify, I think at this moment, we have never thought of the indicators. But in Ontario market, we have seen one of the companies, CAA, they have already gained 300% uptick in the pandemic year, given the, the issue of uh, the launching of usage insurance. And I believe this uh, significant uh, number can indicate both consumers and also the companies have benefited in the launching of this um, recommendation. Also in Ontario market, we can see a lot of FinTech have already joined the uh, uh, industry, for example, Sonnet or on, on, uh, on Elia. Uh, these two new fin has already um, mentioned that they also gain a considerable uptake in uh, in these years. 
so uh, with these proofs, I guess uh, this is a very uh, convincing um, evidence that our recommendation to use the base insurance um, uh, is a visible and meaningful um, recommendation. Thanks so much, Dorothy. And I'd quickly add just two, two points on that front. One is that, um, you know, when we, when we kind of look to the UK, which has been doing this for quite some time, um, they noted that consumers who end up staying with providers for longer periods of time end up paying higher rates than new con consumers that switch to new providers. So I think while Dorothy's kind of speaking to the benefits for the insurance industry, there's also benefits to these practices for consumers in terms of savings. And then the other thing I would say on the recommendations is in terms of the phases and how uh, Adele kind of presented our recommendations, we really kind of focus on the first phase of information gathering, which is kind of low cost for regulators to really continue to size this issue and to pilot and test the interventions that will be most meaningful in driving both benefits for consumers and for the insurance industry. Really. Okay, um, <clears throat> thank you team. I've got four questions, I think, from Ellen, Gina, Sarah, and Leo uh, that are going to come in our, in our third segment. But for now, we're going to Jennifer Welsh for her one or two questions. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, very, very interesting presentation. So I've got two questions. The first is, um, you've done a nice job on identifying who's responsible for different um, recommendations. And like many policy fields in Canada, we have this jurisdictional problem of federal, provincial. And there's a lot of language in the report and the presentation around the Competition Bureau convening, encouraging. And I just wonder um, what sources of influence and authority do you think it has to do that effectively? And can you think of um, other actors in other domains that have played the kind of role you'd like the Competition Bureau to be playing uh, that you might point to, to give us some comfort that it could actually do this? Uh, that's my first question. The second is, um, you talk about cultural barriers to switching, and you also talk about economic trust uh, between um, consumers and providers, which are kind of softer um, mechanisms. And I just wanted to know from your recommendations, which are getting specifically at those things, the lack of trust and the cultural barriers. Great, thanks so much, Jennifer. So for your first question, I'm gonna turn that over to John. So just to talk a bit more about, you know, the role that the Competition Bureau can play and um, what actors we might look to as evidence that this is possible. Just to kick us off, if you don't mind, John. Yeah, so, so the role that the Competition Bureau can play is kind of multifaceted depending on the industry. And um, in some industries, it plays an enforcement role. So if, if it's um, regulated federally, and let's say there's a transaction uh, between um, you know, cell phone uh, providers, a merger, let's say, then the Competition Bureau may actually uh, be intervening in that process at, in an enforcement function uh, and, and regulating competition in that market. Uh, however, it also has an advocacy wing and its advocacy wing uh, conducts research. So that's actually the wing that, that we are participating with in this project, conducting research on markets to investigate these barriers surrounding switching, consumer information, information asymmetries, uh, potentially you know, misleading advertising, and seeing how uh, they can support markets that aren't directly under their purview in terms of regulation um, through this advocacy uh, and research component of their organization. So it has done this um, in the cell phone uh, industry. It's, it's released reports, so not just in enforcement capacity or, or the uh, telecoms industry rather. Uh, it's, it's done thorough research and we've looked at those reports. Uh, we've kind of drawn on those reports and how, how we've thought about some of these issues and how we've thought about what switching costs are. So we tried to complement that type of prior research in the research that we produced uh, in this report in some ways uh, to make it fitting of, of their role and responsibility. And just to highlight one more time that uh, when it comes to solvency, um, insurance, auto insurance, would have a federal regulatory uh, component. However, when it comes to market regulation, uh, it's provincially regulated. So in this 
sense, the Competition Bureau would play an advocacy component, and I think they can do so effectively. The reason why they can do so effectively in this case is because there is so much that is unknown about the market. There is so much data that needs to be generated. So this type of research and, and this type of advocacy work will actually, I would, I would think, produce a positive externality um, in its effects. Uh, so, so that's the long and the short of, of my response, uh, but, but happy to dig into that more uh, if there's further questions. Thanks so much, John. And then um, Adele, I'll pass this, the next one on to you, thanks. Yeah, for sure. Um, thank you so much for your question on the, uh, in terms of the cultural um, barriers and, um, or the culture around switching as a barrier to consumer mobility and the uh, lack of economic trust. I think there are two recommendations that specifically address uh, both of those individually. Um, number one, our recommendation around encouraging uh, the use of or promoting the development of comparison tools and, and shopping around through direct comparison tools that consumers can, can access and use. Um, I think that addresses your point on um, a lack of economic trust because economic trust in this context is eroded due to information asymmetry. So when, um, consumers are not necessarily being upfront with their personal data and as well insurers not being upfront with rate transparency. So that's when we see economic trust being eroded. And we think that comparison tools that consumers can access easily um, themselves are a way of increasing rate transparency and therefore um, limiting the effects of, of economic distrust. Um, in terms of the cultural uh, effects, that we're really specifically talking about um, something that we heard from a lot of consumer advocates that we spoke to, which was the use of insurance brokers and the role that insurance brokers play as information intermediaries in the industry and how um, consumers might feel limited in terms of their options or limited in the information that they can access when seeking to switch because of a loyalty they might feel to a specific insurance broker and the personalization of that relationship. Um, and so, Again, I think the comparison tools also address that, but I think as well our, our uh, idea of using more digital technologies and specifically usage-based policies um, kind of eliminate the need for insurance brokers and also provide a lot more uh, power to consumers in, in being able to access their, their own data and, and access their information and their options around switching themselves. And so I think those two, uh, of our recommendations specifically address um, those two points. I would also add on really briefly, I know we're running over time on this segment, but um, I would also add on to uh, John's answer that I think we, we really gained a lot of information from our discussions with consumer advocates and the role that consumer advocacy groups are playing right now in the industry. Um, and we, I think, built that in into our recommendations um, to gain some insight from those consumer advocacy groups more directly um, for the Competition Bureau's advocacy arm. So yeah, that was, that was my quick, not so quick answer. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, on to Dirk now, a question or two from Dirk. Hey everyone, um, thank you so much for that presentation. I think you really succeeded in making a super opaque uh, subject quite accessible. So congratulations on that. Um, Maybe just to pick up on, on what Adele was just talking about, um, I'm, I, I think you, you convincingly argued that a big problem here is sort of consumer inertia, awareness, um, um, and um, ways to kind of trigger um, shopping around and, and potential switching. And so I, I was wondering um, um, whether you considered uh, recommending something like the um, independent consumer representative um, that you you looked at in Ireland as an as um, sort of a third party or other consumer advocacy tools that could kind of uh, serve as a stand in for the um, for that consumer and and um, eliminate that problem of inertia. Um, that was question one, and then question two. Um, one thing I would like to know more about, I think, from, from the brief, is the relationship between the Competition Bureau and um, the industry in this case, um, and how um, sort of constructive or coercive it, it is at present, and how you see the balancing of enforcement mechanisms um, versus sort of incentivizing or sort of collaborative uh, mechanisms that you've, you've highlighted a bunch of 
um, I think bad, bad practices in the industry. And so is it really a matter of, of course of mechanisms or is there um, the potential for a more constructive uh, relationship? Great, thanks so much, Dirk. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna kick that off uh, with your first part around the consumer representative and then maybe I'll let Dorothy pile on for the, the second piece around the relationship between industry and the and the competition bureau. Um, so on the consumer representative, that as Adele was kind of just mentioning at the set, the end of her answer there, that was actually a really important finding for us, was talking to the um, consumer groups and finding that they just have really limited capacity. They almost didn't have the capacity to talk to us as part of this research. And we only heard back from one of the many that we, we contacted. And so that's why for us, our ninth recommendation was really focused around recommending that ideally jurisdictions would look to Alberta's case of having a, con a consumer representative, a dedicated person that not only had the mandate to voice the concerns of consumers, but to collect those that feedback on an annual basis. Um, other models are kind of are, that are pursued in other jurisdictions are kind of at a, at a federal level, there's an ombud service. So that's more broadly to collect consumer concerns, but they have quite a wide mandate. So I think that that's, that's quite a challenge to do that federally, especially given the jurisdictional considerations here. And then the other thing that is being used in Ontario right now, which I think could be improved through kind of looking to Alberta's model is um, they've kind of identified a panel of nine people that are each supposed to represent various actors from trade unions to um, different groups that kind of advocate on um, the basis of, you know, consumers that experience collisions, et cetera. So they have a number of people on this panel that represent groups with various consumer interests, um, but nine people <laughs> representing consumer concerns and then no direct channel for consumers to voice issues, I think is a, a bit of a limitation in the model that Ontario is currently using. Um, I hope I've captured that <laughs> adequately. And then to your second question, I'll just kick it off um, before seeing if Dorothy wants to add. On the relationship between the Competition Bureau and industry, I think that one uh, complicating piece is the jurisdictional issue. So ultimately the Competition Bureau doesn't have a lot of direct connection to industry. I mean, they would engage with them through consultations or if they were doing a research report, they would engage with them. Uh, to understand the industry perspective, for example, in this case, um, the Insurance Bureau of Canada, but ultimately this falls at the provincial level. So you'd be kind of interested in the dynamics and industry influence at a provincial territorial level. Um, and I think that comes back to actually your first question uh, in terms of managing influence is that for the case of Ontario, for example, um, consumers are mainly represented through this panel and while there has been kind of some more intentional data collection, like the residence reference panel that, that Jonathan mentioned, uh, there's, I think there's still a lot more work that could be done to ensure that, that that power is kind of checked and that consumers actually have a direct way to um, influence and to speak to regulators regarding their concerns and, you know, I think the Alberta model is quite a good one to look at in that case because of the requirement to collect that data annually. Uh, Dorothy, did you wanna add anything in terms of more kind of perceptions from our stakeholder engagement on that issue? Sure, sure. So I will uh, try to add, add briefly. So in the case of Ontario, Fisher actually have a consumer panel and uh, in the panel, there are nine representatives. So consumer, um, uh, they have around two representatives. And for the rest of the members, they are all from uh, different financial services and also the uh, industries. And in the panel, they have a lot of uh, engagement and communications. And the panel is trying to balance the consumer and also the industry capacity in meeting the growing uh, or changing demands. So I think this is a way to um, like balance uh, different uh, people perspective on the issues and also um, like uh, have a better collaboration in launching um, new policy, for example, the user base insurance. Um, um, the FISRAS already included data uh, and, and analytics in their annual business plan and 
for this uh, decision, they are really consult different industry players and also consumer, and they are um, all agree with this trend. So I think this is one of the evidence that um, is this a balance in their communications. Okay, thank you, uh, Dorothy. Thank you, team. Uh, I'm going to turn now to two questions from the Competition Bureau. I've got Matthew McCarthy first, and then Keldon Bester. Matthew, over to you. Hi, uh, thanks for that, that presentation, guys. It was very interesting. I've, uh, I've done some work on car insurance here at the Bureau myself, so uh, I know what a uh, deep talk topic it can be. Um, so Jonathan, something you had mentioned in the presentation just sort of maybe just sparked a question, and, and, and hopefully you know more about this than I do, but um, generally in the private, you know, in the, in the public uh, car insurance regimes, it's sort of worked out between the government and the provincial uh, health insurer who um, who will be responsible for what. But I was just wondering when you talked about eliminating duplicative coverage, what were you thinking in terms of uh, private insurance regimes like in Ontario? Are you thinking about uh, maybe eliminating that coverage with, with an OHIP or with a private insurer, um, you know, your work insurance or something like that? Well, I think, I think the way that we're thinking about that, um, especially related to the way that was framed um, in the Marshall Report, the section that, that we analyzed in the Marshall Report, which in which it kind of stated that um, to allow the market to have a greater role um, in this capacity may uh, improve you know, what, what consumers are getting uh, in the end because there were certain associations that were interviewed that noted that there is a large percentage that had duplicative coverage uh, in that report. Um, so it was kind of being implied that, uh, you know, a regulatory uh, review of what the components of the basic uh, standardized statutory insurance are um, may be able to improve outcomes for consumers. Because one of the issues, if you have duplicative coverage, is that if you have private insurance um, and an insurer is assessing your risk, some that we have interviewed have uh, implied that um, potentially those factors could be taken into account. Um, and that means that people would be assessed at a different rate depending on what their current coverage is. Because um, in the case of auto insurance, it's a second payer. Um, so, so you would actually be going to private insurance first. Uh, so that's, that's the basic uh, issue and it's working around that. Our intuition on that would be to look at the current regulations, the current policies uh, that mandate that and, and seeing if those can be tweaked uh, to provide more optionality. And, but on that front, I mean, it's, it's also uh, something where you have to balance what's uh, in the best interest of the public as well as what's in the best interest of the market. And it's trying to strike that balance in, in figuring out what's best for consumers uh, in the process. So I think that uh, we were thinking about it in terms of regulatory review. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's go to Keldon Bester now, please, for a second question from the Competition Bureau. Yeah, thanks so much again for the, for the presentation. And uh, you know, this isn't a particularly inventive question, but you know, through the interviews and, and through your research, which of these, and it might you know, just be a personal opinion, but which of those recommendations do you think has the greatest potential to, to really lead to a, a material change uh, in the industry? Um, you know, that obviously not back, we haven't had the opportunity to quantify, but, you know, through those conversations, which one jumped out as like, you know, uh, one that would really, you know, shift the, shift the landscape from today as, as we think about how we prioritize uh, our uh, advocacy efforts? Great, thanks, Keldon. I can kick that off and then maybe I'll just open it to my team because as you said, this might be a bit of a personal uh, bias question based on our research expertise. But I think where I would lean is probably towards the um, comparison tool or the prompts as kind of a, at, at, the first, at the outset of understanding these issues, ultimately consumers need to understand that there are other options and be able to easily look at those options to even begin to think about switching. So the first step for me is to promote shopping around. But I would say that as much as it's you know enticing to jump into one specific solution and tool, I think why 
um, you know, we phased these and put data collection first is, you know, our view really is that you need to start with getting more data and sizing this issue to make that sort of determination. The data is just still too limited in the Canadian context. You know, we relied on a, a survey, a, an online survey of 4,000 people, largely across Canada. And then we looked to jurisdictions like Alberta, which is only one uh, jurisdiction that has, you know, uh, historical data on these issues. So that would be my recommendation and caution uh, in terms of that recommendation. I don't know if other team members want to jump in with their view on this issue. We've got five more questions and we're about All right, to okay, Chris, move us on. That's <laughs> we're gonna get to the lightning round, folks. So here's, so yes. Ellen is the first one in the lightning round and her microphone's not working. So everybody on the team, please read the questions from Ellen in this order. Ellen, Gina, Sarah, Leo, Kristen, we might get to all of them and we need a 15 second answer. So Ellen's question is, why did you choose Ontario rather than BC or Alberta? Sure, quickly. Uh, we didn't go with BC because it's government uh, regulated, so there can't really be switching between one provider. And we didn't go, we went with Alberta, um, Ontario over Alberta because of the size of the market, being that Ontario is, is quite a large, large market. Okay, Gina's question, and I'm going to read it just to save time here. Since driving, driving data would be recorded and used without people's consent, this could be a real concern in terms of data ownership and privacy. Do you think the pros outweigh the cons on usage-based insurance policy? Who wants to take a shot at that one? Uh, I will take it. I think, yes, the key benefit uh, is that UBI allows drivers premium to more accurately represent the time spent on the road. If you're a driver, you would love that because in Ontario case, you can save five to 10% from the original price you have to pay. Uh, we do agree there a concern of, over data ownership and data privacy. That's why we suggest in our recommendation that there is a need for the um, Commission Bureau to work on means to ensure consumer control over data. So as long as the data uh, concerns are safeguard, I agree the pros are with the cons. Okay, Sarah's question I think is gonna be for Dorothy. Uh, <laughs> which of your emerging challenges will have the most impact on your policy recommendations? Um, I would say the second one, digital transformation, because the technology is really transforming every aspect of a PNC industry, telematics, AI, sharing economic, um, increasing demand of one-stop service. Um, yeah, and the industry landscape and all the shift of focus uh, of the industry from itself to product itself to a personalized consumer uh, experience. Therefore, in our recommendation, we suggest more flexibility, higher transparency through user-based insurance, more comprehensive data collection to monitor consumer behavior, data ownership uh, portability, and all above recommendations are closely tightened to the challenge of digital transformation. And we believe they're all feasible, useful, and meaningful. Yeah. Okay, second last question from Leo. You mentioned that Ontario consumers are more likely to renegotiate with the service providers rather than switch. Are they saving when they are renegotiating? Quick answer. I'll take, yeah, I'll take this one. Um, so just in the context of auto insurance, if we're thinking about renegotiation, we can think about it at the end of your term. Um, so once a year, you have the, the chance basically to renegotiate unless you want to bear costs uh, exiting your plan. Um, so renegotiating could be the adjustment of optional coverage. So if you eliminate your optional coverage, you will save money. Um, and the ICED, the ICED survey data that we analyzed um, indicated that Ontario's consumers uh, anticipated savings from renegotiation, while well, 36% of those uh, captured in that um, component of the survey, uh, savings between $20 to $100 from renegotiating their plan uh, in a given year. So I would say that from the perspective of consumers and just when you think it through, uh, renegotiation can definitely uh, lead to savings. Good job, finger on the pulse of the data, well done. Very last question from Kirst, uh, Kristen McLean. Great question. Did you come across any nudges used by other jurisdictions aimed at tackling consumer inertia that were effective? Nudges, behavioral economics stuff. Anybody wants to take a shot at that? Yeah, I'll quickly show. Uh, grab Go with that, showed it that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, for the UK, uh, they did um, randomized control trials uh, to test different methods and they found that sending letters with 
um, not only uh, your current rate, but the amounts that other companies are offering was the best way to nudge consumers to, to switch to new providers. Good, good. Okay, folks, we're gonna bring this to a close. Uh, I wanna thank all of you out there, uh, faculty, students, staff, uh, Competition Bureau, everybody that's out there. Thank you all for attending. Uh, this has been a great session. Uh, special thanks to the Competition Bureau. Thank you very much for sponsoring a policy lab in our MPP program, and we hope we will do one again in the near future. Uh, other special thank you to Ken Bosenkuhl. Thank you for being a, a coach of the team. And uh, I hope you had fun, Ken. I think you did, and I think the students had fun too. Uh, and of course, thank you to the team. So Emily, Dorothy, John, and Adele, thank you very much for a great job. Uh, who knew that property and casualty insurance could be so much fun? So much fun. Okay, thank you all very much, folks. We are back in one hour for session number four.